Hi, um, as David just said, fabricators perspectives, but really what this is about is about what's cost effective uh, design and fabrication. So we're, I'm gonna, today I'm gonna talk about play girders, girder spacing, difference in connection, triple I gutter bent caps, cross frames, welding, and materials and coating. So one at a time, uh, let me first say that several times today you've heard about references back to guidelines and specifications and documents. And I'm gonna do it again, because if, for you guys that don't look these up, you really need to, because it's there is a lot of information out there from a lot of people that have been involved in this business, in this industry for decades. So the first part of this about girders, really is just based off two documents out there, two AI, two ASTO NSBA documents. It's a G1.4, which is guidelines for design details, and G12.1, which is guidelines to design for constructability and fabrication. And what you see on the screen right here is, is from the G1.4, and you'll see it, it lists on the right, A through F. And I'm not gonna go through these specifically one at a time, but basically I'm just gonna be brief and show you what, what they're talking about. You really need to know for sure, go into the two documents is the place to go. So basically you probably all know this, but steel mills have minimum size requirements when you order a plate. So it's 48 inches wide is about the minimum you're gonna get. Some mills is even more, maybe 72 inches wide is the minimum slab you gotta get. So what fabricator has to do, they have flanges and webs. They're gonna to have to nest these flanges together to get a, pl a plate wide enough to order. And, it, and if they don't have enough material to order from that plate, you can imagine that's a drop is wasted material. You're paying for things you're not using. So what you see here on, on the little chart that I've just shown with the girders one through five, this is actually from a design that we had not too long ago that we had to order material from. The job was five girders wide, simple span, but it was curved. So as you imagine, the inside girders are shorter on the curve. So they had, it was consistent, they did good, they, had, they were consistent ordering the same width flanges here, trying to, well, not, excuse me, not on this one, but they were consistent 20 inch flanges, but the thicknesses varied. They had two at one and three quarters, two at two inches, and the very outside longest girder was two and a half inches. So if you happen to order a 48 inch wide minimum plate or a 72 inch wide, depending on which wheel mill you go to, you might look at that. You got inch and three quarter, inch and three quarter, 40 inches wide. Well, you've already, by the time you put your kerf in there, you've lost six inches of material no matter how long that plate is. Same thing with the two inch flange. Now the two and a half inch flange, what are you gonna do? You got a 20 inch plate, if you're having to order a 48 inch wide flat. So I'm just telling you, just things to think about. So the best thing to do here, when your section goes up, if you could have kept everything to inch and three quarter, or everything to two inches, either way, and then change the width of the plate to keep the same section on there, then, you could nest your material together and not have all that wasted material. So basically what, and you gotta think about it when you have, go back. Back to this drawing from the, from the guidelines. As you'll see you have, it's a plate girder between field slices. You got a top flange one, one inch, the middle top flange two has gotten two inches. And the flange on the on the right is down to one inch again. So what so what you want to do here, you can see how the flanges were nested in each plate to get the width on it. But you also got to think about the length of the center plate because the fabricator is going to want to make as much as few of assemblies as possible. So in this this situation, you got three slabs. You got to take the slabs. You put them together, so you got a 
Prepare the ends of each slab. Put them in assembly together, butt up together to prepare your weld, to weld it, to test the weld. So basically in this situation, you have two welds, two tests. But if you had gone through there and made all those planes in separately, you would end up having, it's on this slide, you would end up having four flanges is wide, three different plates. So you'd end up having 12 different plates. So you gotta see, so each girdle line, girdle line one, instead of having the slabs put together, you've got the plan for one, the middle planes for line one, the end plan for line one. So you've got that same assembly that you would have with three separate slabs, then the welding, then the testing. So basically you have eight separate operations for the welding and the testing here, as opposed to two if, you, if it was all one slab. I hate to bring this up because Texas is so good. Uh, some of the things I'm talking about today, Texas has got it covered. Um, but this, this was a textile job, curved job, that curved lines one, two, three, the designer did great. He made all the flanges the same size. They got the girder line four, which was getting longer, and then girder line five, which was even longer. And he started changing the flange thicknesses. So you can tell by the colors here, the yellow shows it jived back with girder lines one, two, three. So you were able to nest all those material together. But then you get to the other three colors, the green, the blue, the pink, there's not much material there. So all three, all those situations, there's no way to nest them. So you're having to buy, to buy the full width plate with it, that little bit of material. Really, it's, it's a big waste of money from, for not just the fabricator, but go, it goes all the way back to the DOT. Because they're having to pay for it because we're having to estimate it that way up front. Okay, to be cost effective, basically you just you say you want to go with common thicknesses to achieve 48 inch wide minimum thickness or the 72 inch wide minimum thicknesses. You want to go with constant flanges for the center girders, which means constant length in there. And you want to go with, definitely go with slab splicing whenever you can. Girder webs. Basically, on girder webs, um, long spans and you're designing your bridge, you come up with a web depth. Well, if you think about it, you don't need that big web depth in the middle of a long span. So if you want to go to haunch girders, you can see how much material you're saving over the long middle portion of the, of the girders. So there's something to think about. Not only did you, you get the aesthetics of the haunch girder, but you also have material savings there. Your spacing, which you know, all this kind of stuff has been talked about at least brought up at least once today. Is uh, you want to look at girder spacing is narrow narrow spacing with more girders. You can go to a wider spacing. Yes, you may have a bigger girder, but you have less girders. And we have looked at some total studies, and um, I saw it. And I can't remember exactly where I picked it up right now because. I made this presentation several years back, but there was a lot, I think it was a federal highway study on this. And they talked about typically when you can go to wider spacing, you can you you can save 20% of the material. Even though you have bigger girders, you have fewer girders, and it, it makes that much difference. Field splices. You know, field splices are necessarily evil, longer girders. But um, something you need to think about, you know, some fabricators, some erectors can, go, can handle the long girders. Some fabricators can't. So when you, you're getting into that range, 140 feet, 160 feet, 120 feet, depending on where you are, the, instead of just automatically putting a field splice right there, show the field splice, but make it optional. Because if, if it can be handled in the longer lengths, it's going to be bid in that longer length and you'll get a cheaper product.
Also looking at, at bolts, um, we've had a lot of field splices here recently that have been going up to big long girders, been going up to inch and eighth, inch and quarter bolts. Um, yes, it's it makes of our smaller splice plate and fewer bolts, but once you get above one inch bolts, the price of bolts starts going up considerably, especially if you get into a situation where you have to have a an inch and an eighth or an inch and a quarter A490 type three bolt. They're not readily available and they're really expensive and it takes a long time to get them. So, but what, what I'm saying is, even when you have seven eighths bolts, which is everybody looks at it and says, okay, seven eighths bolts are normal size. So look at it again. Look and see if you just going up to a one inch bolt, there's not much difference in cost with the bolt, but you can be able to use a shorter splice, less drilling for the shop, Less bolt insulation for the guy in the field. Just something to look at. Nesting material. This is a chart from field splices that we had, another curve job. This is not a Texas job. But um, there's good and bad with this chart. Uh, longer, longer bridge. It was pretty wide. But they had eight different field splices designed on for the structure. So what I've got highlighted here in the colors is the top and bottom plan sizes. So you can see that and if you look at the different colors, yellow is where he used the designer had used one inch plates. So there was enough there to order. And then same thing for the different colors. Um, he grouped it where he could. He did a great job of not going to 16th of an inch material. Um, when you don't have a lot of material, the fabricator may have stock material in eighth of an inch, but he's not gonna have stock material in 16th of an inch sizes. So, but anyway, uh, the designer did good here. He tried to keep everything in quarter of an inches. Could he have done better? Yes, he probably could have. You know, he could have bumped size a little bit, an eighth of an inch here, quarter of an inch there. So if, if you look at where my arrow is and little red arrows, we have an inch and three quarter plate, an inch and five eighths plate. What would have been the harm and actually it would have been more effective to increase that inch and five eighths plate to inch and three quarter. Just little things like that. You, you don't think about it, but those little things do end up saving money there's something to think about. And I'm not going to talk much on this because I know what we've talked about today, but uh, steel bent caps, as you notice, they've been called so many different things over the years, straddle bents, but steel bent cap is a term that we're starting to push now, as Ronnie did in his presentation earlier today. I won't get into those, but yes, from fabricator's point of view, we're definitely pushing for these over the boxes. And definitely the, the stack bridges. Here's the design plans we have. You can see the three, gir three girder on the left, sitting on top of it. Yes, I'm a steel guy, but you can put steel girders on top of them. You can put concrete girders on top of them. So the picture on the right, just a picture of an assembly, uh, girders having to be set up in the shop to be shop drilled with the box itself. And you can see how much space it takes in the shop and how much time it takes to put all that together. So anytime you can put the stack girder on top of the repair cap, you're saving time and money. Different details, basically the you want to be as simple and as repetitive as possible. Next dot, great cross frame design. One bolt in the, in, the, in the corners makes for a simple connection plate. They commonly use 516 fillet wells. You don't want to go more than that because once you go over a 516 weld, you're creating multiple passes with your weld. For example, you go up to a 7 16th weld, what do you have? Three passes. Maybe it's a 3 8 weld, you have three passes. You go up to a half inch weld, I think that's increased to like eight pass, six or eight passes. 
so little things you don't think about, but when you need to go you just just by that sixteenth of an inch between five sixteenths and three eighths or so, you're adding, you're tripling your time, shop time on that. Textile is also very good about putting finish to bear from bearing stiffeners instead of doing a complete penetration well. So that's something you really want to watch out for. Another common thing that's not so much anymore, but because everything that's being done on the merit control, but when your stiffener runs out past your top flange, if you have a lot of burying with top flanges, means that you're going to have a different stiffener. If a if a clipper is required at the top flange, you're going to have a different stiffener for every different flange width. So if you can do without that top flange, if you don't have to worry about uh, stay in place forming or things like that. Just don't clip it if you don't have to. Also, another thing, stiffener details. Um, anytime you can, which is most times it's about every situation, is unless you have a really complex structure, is make sure you put your stiffeners in your cross range perpendicular to the girder flanges. Because if you can imagine, if you have a a lot of vertical curve in your bridge. The girder is going vertical curve, and you and you're forcing the the fabricator to keep every cross frame vertical. So, as the girder curves and the cross frames vertical, that means every stiffener has a different fit. So, a lot of time, if you can just keep that cross frame normal to the flange, that's the way to go. Triangular clips and J clips, that's, that's pretty common now. You don't really have to worry about that. The kitchen cross range. There's a lot I can say about this, but I, I think I'll try to keep it. But basically, same thing as stiffness. Maybe you can keep them simple, keep them repetitive. The cross frame on the bottom right, Virginia DLC cross frame. Is probably the easiest cross frame that we fabricate. It's rectangular. You don't have to worry about your cross frame drops because you take up the cross frame drops in a connection plate. The top and bottom strut are the same angle. The diagonals are the same angle. Diagonals are on one side. So, so when the guy is setting up his jig in the shop, he puts his bottom struts in position, he puts his diagonal on. Tax weld them, move them down to the next position, weld them on. No worry about if there's no welding on the far side. With, and the guy does not have to worry about flipping his cross frame over to continue with it. Cross frame on the left, even though it's a very easy fabrication thing, um, which the fabricator will like it, but the guy in the field directing this thing. It's not one cross frame pickup anymore. It's four pickups. You got to pick up each WT every time. So, good and bad. So basically, I'm talking about the, the three sided weld. Um, you want to avoid welding all around it anytime you can. Basically, what I just talked about, you don't have to worry about flipping the cross frame over to weld it. Anytime you can, if you if you got a short girder or a beam girder, you know, go with channels and cross frames in lieu of using a beam diaphragm. With a beam diaphragm, you're being forced to cope out the far side flange where it bolts to the stiffener with a channel or, or even a, a bent plate diaphragm. You don't have to worry about doing that. Something we're seeing a lot of now is basically it's a lot of really stout cross frames with a lot of bolts. This is one we've had recently. Look at it. 84 bolts in that cross frame. Yes, they're relatively heavy angles on there. It was a sharply curved, sharply skewed bridge, but 84 bolts at every cross frame. A lot for the guy in the shop, a really lot for the guy in the, in the field. So, um, what's what's going to happen here? 
I would say your welding and even your members would fail before the bolts would. Cost effective, lean on bracing easily. I think you guys have seen this picture. This is the third time today, but uh, I won't get into it. The advantages of, of the lean on bracing. Cross rams themselves. Um, here's a picture of a guy in the shop putting a cross frame together. What they do when they, when they make cross frames, they'll actually set up, they'll set a jig for this cross frame. For each and every different cross frame, they got to realign this jig. What, what I want to focus on here is the location of his work points for, this, for his members here. Anytime you can, if you can put the work points of the cross frame at a hole in the member as shown on, on the diagram on the uh, sketch here. You see, I've got a highlight in yellow where the work points are for that cross frame. So, so the, guy, the guy in the shop, He's got his four corners of this cross frame, got gusset plates on the four corners. The cross frame was designed and then unfortunately detailed according to the design with the work points of the members at the center line of the girder web. Well, the guy in the shop doesn't have a girder web here. So what he has to do, he's come to here and drawn with his white soapstone. He's drawn the, by the arrow at the bottom. He's drawn his, his line for a center line of web. He's moved over, he's drawn his line for the, the gauges of the bolt holes and the gusset plates. So then he's, he's placed his gusset plates according to the holes, center out of the hole at his, his line here. And then he's had to go from all, all four corners, he's had to draw a line from the center line of the web over to the center line of the web on the other side of the cross frame. And then he's had to lay his angle down on that. So as you can see, it, it's a basically it's a point in space that's that he has to create. And if you were to use that bolt hole as a work point, he wouldn't have had to create that space. All he'd had to do was put his put his spacing on there for his bolt hole, put his gusset plate there, and his work point's already set for his angle. Okay, another thing, this text, text dot cross frame right here, um, typical, text dot does a good job of working through both holes, by the way. But as you can see, the five inches from work point from the top and bottom of web to the, to the work point hole, if you have, say, for example, a sharp, sharply skewed bridge, and uh, contiguous cross frames going in there. What happens is you have a different camber point at each place for the cross frame. So what it does, your differential deflection between the girder forces new drops at every cross frame. Or if you have a, a bridge going with a deck transition where it changes from 0.05 to 12 to a quarter of the 12, as, you, as you're going down the length of the bridge, you're getting different cross frame drops in every location. So um, something as simple as taking your work point, which is shown at five inches here, taking that and putting plus and minus for the fabricator as an, as an inch or even a half an inch. What it would do, it would, it would allow the fabricator to make the group cross frames and make one cross frame for seven different drops. And all they would have to do then is make more connection plates to handle those, those fewer cross frames. But what, what's, the, what's the loss here? You have much fewer cross frames, but connection plate, just a little CNC cross frame uh, connection plate, no big deal there at all. So for example, what I'm trying to say here, for example, is say you have drops that range from three inches to four inches. And due to your girder spacing and your depth, you have to put a new cross frame in at every quarter inch. So you have a cross frame at three inches, three and a quarter, three and a half, three and three quarter, four. So what's that? Five different cross frames. Now, if he can adjust this work point location, he can make the same number of cross frames with one jig at, at three and a half inches. 
And what you don't realize is hour for hour or cross frame in the shop is the most expensive thing. Talk about whales again, finish to bear, five chicken whales, just to recap. Trying to stay away from whale doll around symbols. Did you realize sometimes you have to have a seal whale here? So you're going to galvanize, whatever. But if you don't have to call for whale all around, don't do it. If you do have a situation, a lot of moisture, or whatever, where that whale needs to be sealed on the corners, do it as shown right here in the bottom right. Just show you typical whale termination details that AWS allows. And then just list it as a seal weld on that corner. So all that what that allows the, the guy in the shop to do is just as he gets to those terminations, he just has to put an eighth of an inch weld or something in there just to seal it. Because if you can imagine you, you got a joint going around the corner and he's trying to hold a quarter inch or a five sixteenth weld over those surfaces, what happens at the corner of that, of that seal plate? You're gonna melt it. You're not gonna you're not gonna keep a good constant weld there. So the weld is actually being detrimental to the situation. Okay, cost effective and efficient materials. Basically, I don't I shouldn't have to tell you this. What's the first option? Unpainted weathering steel. The second option unpainted unpainted weathering steel painted on the ends or in some states they they want it painted on the ex exterior girder just for looks. That's the third option, fully painted. Or as we saw earlier today, the no top coat inorganic zinc systems that are being studied by NSBA and the Federal Highway. Other options. Other options are galvanizing, metallizing, A709, 50CR, uh, being looked at duplex stainless steels that are being looked at right now. So all those are much more expensive than the previous three, but they are out there. There, another publication that is out is shown right here, corrosive pr protection of steel bridges. So if you're not sure or looking at different options, that's one place to look at. Okay, in summary, I rushed through this because there are so many things I had in here that we already talked about today. But if to talk about it again, it means that this shows how important they are. Okay, in summary, break the other fringes, nest, keep the same, Thickness, vary the widths whenever possible to allow your nesting and slab splicing. Herder spacing and field slices. Look at the reduced weight with, with more the wider girder spacing. Look at offering optional field splices. Simple and repetitive connection details, stiffener details. Cover lie girder bins in place of boxes. Cross frames, less labor intensive, fewer bolts. Not, not keeping everything on one side so you don't have to flip the cross frame over to weld it on both sides. Welding, 5 16 maximum fill of welds whenever possible, especially in place of complete joint penetration welds. Unpainted weathering steel. Questions for you. So the things I talked about were the two most effective items. The cost. Painted weathering steel and land sledding. That's it. Thank you.